I'm probably going to give a conversation today um, that may very well be one of the less technical ones that you're going to hear, um, but I think it's important in, in the sense that there's, there's a shift going on around big data and around analytics that I think opens up an opportunity for everybody in this room. And I know that you've been in here today and you've heard a lot of technical conversations about different IT and technology stacks and new technologies that'll help you. And I wanted to talk about a shift that we're seeing uh, from the view of the company that I work for, and I'm the chief research officer for Statistica, an advanced analytics platform. And I'm not going to talk too much about Statistica today, but I want to talk about what's happening around algorithms and models and advanced analytics and how we're using the data that's come from big data, uh, which is the focus of today's event, to do kind of interesting things. Don Tapscott wrote a book in 1995 called The Digital Economy, and it really kind of got us off to a start years ago when we were discussing and looking at ways uh, how the new internet economy was going to impact our business and how it was going to drive us forward. And if you think about it, Don had it right in 95 that this was going to be rather disruptive, and it certainly was. Um, it started to give us new ways of doing business. It gave us the application uh, stuff that we all have on our smartphones today. It's driven us to being in a highly connected world. And that drive to move us towards being more connected is certainly given way to why we're all here in London today, which is to talk about big data. Um, and I don't get too hung up on big data from a definitional standpoint, but I think that it's okay for us to acknowledge that it's gotten darn big. And what we're really doing today is, is we're working with all of the data. For a long time, the enterprise has been forced to, because of the cost and or the lack of technology, they've been forced to ignore some of the data. They've been forced to not be able to bring all of the data that they wanted to bring into their ecosystem uh, for use. And, and IoT, I think, is one of the last kind of drivers of this trend. If you look at the IoT world, and I've got some fun numbers up behind me, 34 billion devices will be connected uh, to the internet economy by 2020. And this interconnection that's happening and all of the data that's flowing from all of these sensors just makes big data bigger. And so we've spent a lot of time and energy over the last few years worrying about how to define big data. And I used to be an industry analyst, like you know, a Gartner or Forrester guy, and I used to give a lot of talks about big data. And it was interesting, I came to the conclusion at one point that the analyst community was literally making a living giving talks about how to define big data. And I'm sure you've heard it defined a lot of different ways over the course of today's content. And one of my favorite things that I've bumped into is all of these different methodologies that talk about, well, it's about the volume or it's about the velocity. Uh, one of my friends, Doug Laney, is the gentleman who wrote the famous blog post that kind of gave birth to the multiple Vs of big data. And that definition of big data is kind of where we've gotten hung up over the last few years. And I'm here to make the case that Don was probably right in 1995, that the digital economy, all of the things that we're able to do in, in this connected world with all of this new data has given birth to a new direction. But I'm also going to poke just a little bit of fun at how we're defining and how much importance we're putting on the data because I don't think it's just about big data. And I certainly don't think it's about how we define it. To overcome that definition, I personally felt as an ex-analyst that I should write my own definition of big data, and so that's mine. Those are Sean's 10 Vs of big data. The vast volumes of vigorously vexing, variable, verbose, and variable uh, visualized high velocity data. And of course, I thought it was rather important that I finish that sentence with from Silicon Valley. Right? You guys have talked about Hadoop today, you've talked about NoSQL today, you've talked about cloud data today, you've had this conversation that's been very data centric. And I don't blame you. But the point I want to make is, is I don't think it's about how you define the data. I think really where we're finding or maybe losing the conversation a little bit is about what we do with the data. Because we get kind of caught up as IT nerd technical type people in speeds and feeds, right? We always kind of want to talk that way. This is a quote that comes from the analyst group Gartner. One of their executive vice presidents said this on stage last year. And I liked it so much that I've included it in a lot of my presentations. Data is inherently dumb. 
And I'll make the case today that I agree with them. I think that data is interesting. I think it's important. I think we have to manage it. I think we should take advantage of all of the great technology from the big data vendors, and we should put some big data into our ecosystem where it makes sense. But because data is dumb and it doesn't actually do anything unless you know how to use it and how to act on it, it brings us to the cornerstone of my conversation today because basically algorithms are where the real value is and the ability to act on the data. So I know that when we come to big data summits or conferences like this, we end up kind of getting bogged down in the Vs and the, and the stacks. I'm sure there's been some very interesting technology stacks behind me today. And I'm not gonna focus on that. What I wanted to do is, towards the end of the day today, bring your minds back to what it is that we actually do with the data. And companies are moving towards applying algorithms to data in a very interesting way. Some of the bigger brands that I encounter in the US are global brands like Campbell's Soup and Ford are out there investing and buying their way into this new economy. These are companies that aren't technology companies. I like the fact that Campbell's Soup is on here and that they spent $125 million in the last year to kind of turn on a venture capitalist fund so that they could make investments in analytics because they already have the data and they're managing the data and they're looking for a way to apply advanced analytics and insight into the data that they have and they're willing to go out and spend money on it. And I think that that's kind of interesting. You know, when a company that makes soup for a living is willing to make investments in technology at this level. If you look at the car manufacturers, whether the logo is Ford or if it's Tesla, it doesn't really matter. The automobile industry has a lot of data. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how they can take action with the data and how they can move forward with the data and how they can add value to the relationships that they have with their customers by taking advantage of the algorithm economy that's upon us. So another Gartner quote here, and I find this one interesting. By 2020, 75% of large and mid-size organizations will compete using IP that is advanced analytics or algorithms of their own. And I wonder if that surprises a lot of you here in the audience, because once again, I'm sure most of today at Big Data London, you've talked about the big data, but I want to make the case this afternoon for the fact that the algorithm side of this, the action side, the insight side, is where things are very important. And when Don Tapscott wrote his book in 1995, I think he was spot on, but I think that the digital economy is starting to give way to the algorithm economy. And you start to see it in the investments that companies are willing to make. Companies that are not vendor companies like you see here at the Expo today, right? These guys are out there trying to buy their way into better insight and better action. And there's a few areas that they want to apply it. And the reason that they're interested in applying it is because all of us have gotten very used to taking advantage of algorithms. How many of you get a little annoyed now when you interact with a piece of technology or a service and it doesn't know who you are or it doesn't know what you bought last time or it doesn't know what you should buy today. We're starting to get kind of, kind of relaxed with this. If I had polled the audience a year or two ago or maybe five or six years ago, we were still getting some pushback from people going, I don't, I don't really like it when that application reminds me that it remembers what I bought. American Express notifies us when we have strange transactions. I thought it was kind of funny once. They called me. I was actually on a trip coming here, and uh, it, was be, it was years ago, and I needed a black suit. I was going to a conference in Germany, and I needed a European suit to wear for the show. You can see I've now given up, and I wear blue jeans everywhere I go. But that night after I bought the suit, American Express called me and said, Mr. Rogers, we just wanted to call and confirm that you made a purchase today at the suit house place. Did you buy some fancy clothes today? And they were surprised because they know me pretty well. And I was surprised that they knew me that well. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is now you kind of expect it, don't you? So my American Express card is broken. I snapped it along that silver strip on the back while I've been traveling this week. And I had a few free minutes in my hotel room the other day, so I called Amex and I said, look, I'm in London. 
I live here, I'd like you to send me a card in London so that I can have a business, uh, you know, Amex card for the rest of my trip. And they said they'd be happy to do that, but let me transfer you to this other office to make it happen. And the fellow that answered the phone says, good afternoon, American Express fraud, how can I help you? <laughs> I said, well, I, you know, I broke my card and I'd just like a new one because I'd like to go to a pub this evening. And, uh, and he said, that's fine, Mr. Rogers, let me ask you a couple of questions to confirm your identity. And he asked all the normal ones, and I wasn't surprised by the questions. And then he said, could you please pay attention to the next four-part question? In 2012, Mr. Rogers, did you buy a Chevy, a Ford, a Mitsubishi, or a Chrysler? <laughs> now, I do not remember on my credit card application telling America Express what kind of car I bought in 2012. I got the answer right. He asked me, I'd like to ask you one more. He said, in uh, 2014, did you buy this car, that car, this car, that car? And I, I said, could you repeat them? And he did, and I said, I didn't buy any of those cars. And he goes, oh, I'm gonna have to ask you some more questions. And I'm like, now how did I get that wrong? I mean, I'm, I'm not wealthy, I don't have 30 cars, and then and while the guy's talking to me, I realized, damn it, I, co I co-signed for my daughter's car. American Express knew I had done it. I couldn't remember I had done it. So the interesting thing is, is that when you have access to all the data, you can make better decisions. And American Express does that on a regular basis. Amazon does it every time any of us log in, right? It says people like you bought this. Last time you were here, you bought that. You should probably buy this. And when we go to an e-commerce site and it doesn't do that, I get kind of annoyed. So I travel about 120 nights a year for my company and I travel globally and I stay at the Hiltons because I like them. And I complained a couple of months back when I was in Chicago because the air conditioning wasn't working in my room. I'm kind of a big guy, I like it cold and cool. It was not cold, it was not cool, it was really uncomfortable. And I did a lot of whining about it at the front desk. So a couple of weeks later I checked into a hotel in California, walked into my room, it was like a freezer. <laughs> And I was like, what in the heck is going on here? And I turned the dial down a little bit. And I'm like, gee whiz, man, it's cold. And it dawns on me that they kept track of the data, right? They're influencing their service with me in a really smart way. By the way, I'm staying at the Hilton over here. They did not get the memo. So <laughs> you look at some of the other examples I've got behind me, and I think you guys are kind of familiar with this, right? Algorithms are starting to find a way into our lives, but we're okay with it. And that's the interesting part. We've adopted it, we expect it, and because we expect it, companies like Campbell's and Ford and every other Fortune 500 firm in the world are starting to try to figure out how far they can push that envelope, and that roadway or that on-ramp is the algorithm economy. And there's three ways that I see companies kind of getting into this. So as you leave here today, give this some thought. Do you have a product or a service that you can embed analytics into in order to increase the value of that product or service? Or is it possible for you to go back and be a total renegade and sit in a meeting and say, I have an idea for a whole new line of business? It's happening, and I've got some examples I'm gonna share with you in a minute. And last but not least, can you scale what you're doing with analytics by leveraging the wisdom of crowds and open marketplaces? And what I'd like to do is for the next just couple of minutes, I wanna share a few examples of how companies are doing this and kind of give you some things or food for thought as you leave here today. How many of you have thought about the technology in a garbage can? Really? I ask that question whenever I use this slide. I've never had anybody raise my hand. Two people over here are thinking about garbage cans. This is a great example. This is the big belly garbage can that's used in the US. It's a 50 gallon size city garbage can, the normal sort of garbage can that you would see here on the street or trash bin that you would see here on the street in London. But what they did is they looked at what they were doing for a living and decided to disrupt the industry. They put a sensor driven system inside of it that tells the control system when it's full. They put a solar panel on it to power the trash can. They put a trash compactor in it so that they could multiply the capacity of the can by five so that they were able to actually push 250 gallons of trash into the 50 gallon garbage can. And then they put a wireless communication system in it. They hooked it up to Google Maps and alerts. They used the alerts to tell the trash trucks when they're full and when they need to be emptied. It's kind of smart if you think about it. 
You don't even have to have my help to think about the ROI, gas, time, people. They're reinventing how we collect trash in the US. It's been so successful that they've come out with a full line of recycle bins, um, which is having a great economic and uh, uh, green effect on the US. And we all know that the US is way behind in that area, so I think that's cool. And they have a full analytics suite, and they use predictive analytics algorithms to predict when the trash cans are going to be full. And they're pretty good at it. Think about how much time, money, and energy is wasted by trash collectors as they empty half full bins. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you run a city like London or New York, this is actually a very valuable utilization of not only data and sensors, but the algorithms that are behind it. This is an important story. Um, I'm a social addict. If you look, looked me up on Twitter today, you'll see I've been very active there today in the last week, and I like to share information, and I give talks about how you can utilize social data to do things better and smarter. And after one of my chats, I came down off the little stage, a fellow walks up to me, says, you know, Sean, I really liked what you had to say. I'm in the French fry business. Okay. Because I'd like your help, because I think what we'd like to do is we want to make our French fryers social. I'm like, did you want to set up a Facebook page for your French fryer or a Twitter account? What exactly were you looking for? This guy had a brilliant idea while he sat in this class that I taught. And he said, look, we're in an industry that's getting commoditized. We make the Rolls Royce of French fryers. And it's pretty expensive. It's got sensors in it. It tells us how hot the oil is. It tells us if you replace the filter. It keeps track of your utilization and how many hours the burner's on and all these other diagnostics. And it phones home on its own and tells us how it's doing. And we're already using that data to do predictive warranty work so that we know when it's going to fail in advance. I said, man, that's cool. What about the Twitter account for your fryer again? And he said, well, what we really want to do is we're having pressure from an offshore company that's making a French fryer that looks just like ours. Costs about half. How many of you work for businesses that are pushing back against commoditized competition today? These guys are having the same problem. And he said, what we want to do is, is we want to be able to put some algorithms, some analytics, and some social data against the fryer. So what we want to do is, is we'd like to listen to people on Facebook and Twitter as they say, hey, I just had a great... Uh, uh, I just had a great uh, sandwich and I had wonderful chips at such and such. And they want to be able to build a baseline and be able to warn the restaurant, their end user customer, when they have a quality problem. And they want to mix the warning or the alert with data. So they want to be able to reach out to the restaurant and say, dear Mr. Restaurant Owner, we've noticed that there's been a downtick in sentiment about your fried foods. And this down tick shows us that you've got a quality issue and we checked on your fryer and you've got the temperature set 15 degrees too low and you haven't changed the oil in four months and we really recommend that you do these two things so that you stop getting negative responses on the, on the social networks. They reinvented fryers. French fryers. There's a lot of people in Belgium that would like to know about that. I think it's cool, and the reason I think it's cool is because they didn't reinvent their business. What they did is they looked at what they do, they applied data, and they applied advanced analytics to what they do, what's critical for them. They didn't reinvent or boil the ocean or go off and do anything silly. They found a way to differentiate themselves competitively in their own markets in a way that their, comp their competition couldn't keep up with. I thought it was brilliant. Creating new lines of business with the algorithm economy is an interesting thing as well. And we see a lot of examples, and you can read the details behind me. There is a company here in the Nordics uh, who happens to be a customer of mine at Statistica, and they are a mobile phone company. So think of all the data that the cell and mobile phone companies have on you. They know where you're standing when you make a call. They know what time you call. They know who you call. They know how long you talk to them and so on. Lots of great data. They specialize in cell phones or cellular service in emerging markets where people are, what the terminology is, is they're unbanked. And unbanked is really kind of interesting. These are people that have jobs that work that are probably credit worthy, but they don't have a credit record. They don't have a bank account. And this company wanted to reinvent itself, and they wanted to go beyond cellular and mobile, and they wanted to get into the banking business. So how do you get into the banking business if you don't have any banking information? They used advanced analytics, 
and data on their customers to determine which customers had jobs. How did they do that? They ran algorithms and advanced analytics to determine, well, this person makes phone calls at this length, this duration, from this location every single day. And they started to be able to enhance their risk models a little bit and to create new ways to do business. This particular mobile or cellular company is in the financial services business today making microloans to their customers and doing banking services based on information from their core business. They actually invented a multi, multi million dollar line of business that didn't exist because they used all of that data and they applied the algorithms and so on. Here's a great example. Many of you probably read about GE. They're spending an awful lot of money right now in the space. They are a competitor of mine. They have built the Predix platform, which is an advanced analytics platform. Now, when you think of GE, you don't really think about them being a software company, but you can see if you read my notes up there, they make an awful lot of money with their software. They've completely changed how they do business with people. They used to sell airline engines to airlines. Makes sense, right? You've seen them on the side of these big jets. They don't sell engines anymore. Now they sell uptime. So instead of making United or Virgin Air pay them for the engine, these companies now pay GE for uptime. And in order for GE to be able to do that, they have to understand the preventive maintenance and the failure rates of their engines because now it's all about keeping the engines running on those planes. And they use predictive analytics to do that. It has put GE into an incredibly new line of business over the last few years, and I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 billion in revenue. It's a great example of a company whose roots are in different places, and they're actually changing the line of business and the way that they do things. Last thing I want to talk to you about is something that's near and dear to my heart which is open technology. I'm not a big fan of walled gardens. Um, I like technology that allows me to spread my wings and do things the way I want. I'm sure it's no secret to you that it's probably what Statistica does, and it is, and I'll show you how in a minute, but what I, the point I wanna make is that the algorithm economy is evolving and changing rather quickly. How many of you know about Apervita, the healthcare algorithm company? They actually sell access to algorithms online that you can bring into other solutions so that you don't have to build it from scratch. Apervita, or Algorithmia, I get the names wrong, sorry, 800 different algorithms available at that marketplace. So this is stuff that data scientists and citizen data scientists have designed and made available for you to go out and grab. It's like wisdom of crowds, and it's a great way for all of you to scale what you're doing from an analytics standpoint. This is Data Mapper. They sell uh, they have a platform that sells drone and satellite data online, and they make it available to data scientists. Here's another example. Quantix, or Quantiax, is a really interesting place. If you're a whiz kid and you like to use algorithms, you can go there and they'll give you the data. And then what they'll do is they'll approach you, and if you put a good algorithm into play that's f for, fi for financial technology, you can end up getting paid for it. These guys, it's like a kaggle where you can uh, enter contests and show off how good you are at it. And then they make these algorithms and models available for other people. This is a disruptive technology and it's one that we've built into our platform. So at Statistica, we've actually built Apervita and Algorithmia and a few of these other companies right into the menu bar of our advanced analytics products so that our data scientists don't even have to leave the solution. They can actually go up to the ribbon on the top, hit the button for Apervita, they drag the note on down to the bottom, fill in a few blanks, and they suddenly have access to 800 algorithms at that other end. And I think that that's pretty interesting and that's the type of innovation that we're gonna see that's gonna take us from the digital economy to the algorithm economy in a fast way. So last but not least, just to give you a couple of chuckles before I finish, I think I have six minutes. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Everybody, when we get a new technology, we always try to bend it to do things it wasn't designed to do. Well, we're doing that with algorithms, trust me. And we see a lot of companies that are sort of tripping over themselves, perhaps over-innovating. And so a couple of over-innovation things that I just want to bring to your mind is as you go back to your companies and talk to them about big data and all the things that you can do with advanced analytics, make sure that you're looking at governance. Make sure that you understand how to maintain trust 
for your success, make sure that you don't go too far, because companies are definitely doing that. And they're making mistakes that are definitely part of this early side of an algorithm economy. Some of you, I'm sure, read the BBC. Yesterday afternoon, they ran a news story about Admiral. I added this slide this morning, thanks to my coworker, Alan, who pointed it out. They just told Admiral, no, you can't do that. What they wanted to do is, is they wanted to have you sign up to get an insurance quote, and then they wanted to harvest all of your Facebook data, all the things you like and all the things you don't like. So the example would be is if you were looking at me and you saw that I like race cars and F1 and I like parachuting and I like, you know, whatever else, uh, adrenaline type sports, I might not get the same uh, insurance rate uh, offer that somebody who lives a more sedator, uh, sedator less risky life. Facebook ruled on it and said absolutely not. So this was an example, and believe me, they don't really have a record for saying no. Uh, so I was a little surprised by this news item, but it was interesting that they drew a line and said, look, Admiral, we like you, you're a great company. I think you're over-innovating. I think you're going a little farther than your customers are going to want you to. And I don't think that people fully understand exactly kind of how you're connecting the dots. Um, it resulted in uh, a little bit of a discount for you, but you were giving up an awful lot. Facebook said they were worried that people would edit how they talk and that they wouldn't be genuine on Facebook. And I, I get that that's why it was a problem. Did anybody ever buy a book on Amazon for $23.5 million? <laughs> they had one there for a little while. Um, two competing automatic pricing algorithms. You know how Amazon has outside vendors, third-party vendors, and they use algorithms to set their price. And there was vendor number one had a really good reputation, thousands of reviews, and they found using analytics that they could actually charge a little more and they still didn't lose the deal because their reputation was so good. Vendor number two was kind of trying to play catch up, so what they did is, is they decided that they would always price their book a little lower, and you can see the calculations. And what happened one afternoon is over this out of print book, The Making of a Fly, the genetics of it, <laughs> um, over the course of a couple of weeks, the price moved from $70, and as these algorithms continued to compete with one another, got up to 23 and a half million bucks before they found it. No one lost any money. Uh, no one bought the book. And, but it was a great example of a couple of, uh, a couple of automa automatic algorithms kind of going too far, right? So last but not least, Knight Capital is one of my favorite. This has happened in 2012. These guys were being real careful. They created a brand new trading algorithm that was designed to trade at the speed of light, you know, boom, 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 really, really fast. And it was supposed to look for differentials between the ask and the bid. And on some Tuesday afternoon back in 2012 in August, I believe, they fired up the, the system to do a little testing. Now, they only put a couple of stocks in it, and they put sort of like a weird parameter in it to make sure the algorithm wouldn't actually trade. They fired it up and started running it, and they were doing stress tests and load tests on it. And while it was running, the algorithm found one of the stocks, this energy stock called Exelon, found that there was a gap, and it started to trade it 40 times a second, 2,400 times a minute. They lost $440 million in 45 minutes of testing. I sense someone probably got fired. <laughs> the nice thing for them was is during the test run, because of the volume and because of the type of trade it was, the uh, stock market actually stopped trading on it. But on paper, that night, they went home thinking they lost 440. They ended up losing about $200 million. So, I'm here to make a point, and I'll put an advertisement for myself behind you. We've shifted. The digital economy was very interesting, and it created all kinds of data. You need to start thinking about how you can leverage all the data in your ecosystem so that you can take it to the next level and apply analytics to it and algorithms to it. That's where the payoff is. That's where the promotion is. And that's really why you should be here today, because the data is going to continue and we're gonna manage it. We're gonna put it into cool systems and technology. But in the end, it's about taking action and understanding the data so that you can either enhance the products that you have, create new products, or so that you can share that IP and derive revenue from it in open marketplaces. And with that, I thank you for your time. Have a nice day.